Anybody getting any audio here? Yes. I can hear your voice just fine. Okay, thank you. I they can't just... hear anything else, though. Yeah, okay. I, that's the same here. That's what I was curious about. Thanks. Delta is ready when you are. Sure. I don't know what they're like anymore. They used to be a good airline. Yeah. Nah. Well, I'm 20, 25 years ago. I yeah. don't know. What, I yeah. don't know what they're like now, but. <laughs> I thought you liked to train anyway. I do, and I don't. I, but ninety nine percent of my travel is by personal vehicle. So yeah, yeah, exactly. For better exactly. or for worse. Exactly. I guess Mark is being commercialized here. Well, he's muted, which is probably good. But I wonder yeah, if they but... can. I wonder if they can hear us. Hey, everybody, wave. <laughs> Well, I think the guys, I think the guys on, <laughs> on Zoom here can all hear us. I don't yeah, know. No, no. People. Did did you not see Ken waved and, and Galen waved? I saw, I saw Jeff wave, yes. <laughs> but I didn't see anybody in the crowd wave. So they, yeah, Ken, uh, Ken Brown did. Um, yeah, so they're listening to everything we say. Oh boy, we have a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're wondering why I've called you here today. Yeah. I come before you to uh, stand behind you to speak to you on a subject I know absolutely nothing about. That's my usual MO as well. <laughs> How's Peter? Oh, I'm doing all right. House is dry again, so. I didn't know the house was wet. Yeah, that rainstorm last Thursday, a week, week Thursday. Yeah. There was a, apparently a giant thundercloud right above our house, so. Oh. Water comes over the slab when it rains. When we get a hard rain, not, not so much we get if we get an inch over 12 hours it's fine if we get an inch over an hour it's a problem oh yeah yeah well we just had our roof inspected and you know we're in good shape so i like that we didn't good. didn't get any didn't get any hail damage at all from that storm very good yeah. oh they're going to open it up now it appears looks like or not <laughs> All right, muting, almost 9.30. I'm going to go to the 
Good morning, everybody. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that. That was kind of interesting. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, uh, in-person meeting of the South Canadian Amateur Radio Society and also to those who are online with us this morning uh, via Zoom. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this morning. We've got a great program we'll uh, get to here just shortly. Let's uh, start, though. Uh, do we have any guests with us this morning or newbies? Uh, Good morning. Tell us who you are. Got your license during field day. Welcome, David. Any other new folks? Guests? Yeah. Great. Did you say Rob or Ron? Rob. Yay. Anybody else? Well, cool. Let's start over with Bill and uh, let's go around the room. Ken, K-A-W-G-E. Chris, K-X-5-A-L-C. Bill, A-E-5-F. Chris, K-E-5-J-Z-M. Bing, never inspect five generals. Hank, <laughs> <laughs> K-5-H-H-Q. John, W-5-J-W-Z. Go right ahead. K-K-6-I-P-L. Yeah. Yep. Denny, W A sixty K D. Um, w five R G. Kim N five O B. Bobby K D five S S T. John L K D five U G Y. Sam W five G Z R. John N two M O T. Jeff K D five C K K. Mike K D five S M. L eight five L. And Mark in 5HZR. And Mark in 5AZQ. And I'm going WX5MOR. We got everybody? Anybody uh, skip over? All right. Well, at this time, uh, again, thank you for being here. Oh, wait, wait. Who all do we have online this morning, Mark? Uh, Looks like we've got Carl and Bob and Lee. Good morning, Lee. Uh, Whoever 806721 is. Is that 80 meters? Good morning, Glenn and Lyle and Don. Peter. Hopefully we got everybody there. So good morning and uh, thank you for being here. All right, at this time, I'm going to turn. Mark's going to do some magic with the computer and we're going to start our program this morning. Where's Kim? Yeah, I was going to say, Mark, what I thought I was told you were uh, going to do your magic first. There's Jeff. Please welcome Jeff Martin. He's worked every state, city, county, ocean, boat, human on the planet. That's what Kim said, right, Kim? Yeah. Uh, Jeff's coming in to us live from his villa in uh, somewhere. I don't know where that's at. It's, it's actually close to, to Pryor and Tulsa and that kind of stuff. But uh, welcome, Jeff. Uh, we see your screen. And uh, if you can make that ready to run, you're uh, ready to 
should be ready to present. Thank you for showing up. Okay. Good audio. Well done. My, my screen says this meeting is being recorded. Uh, leave, I guess I can click continue there. Okay. Are you seeing uh, QSL cards up there? Mom. We are, we are. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm playing some slides of uh, rare and exotic QSL cards uh, while I talk. Um, <clears throat> good morning, uh, SCARS. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak. I'm Jeff Martin, K5WE. I live in Wagner County near Coweta and Broken Arrow. Uh, I was first licensed in 1967 at age 16. So I've been a ham for 54 years. Since my first day as a novice, I've been fascinated with DXing. I've worked 357 DXCC entities. Of the 340 entities on the current DXCC list, I've worked them all. My favorite mode is CW, but I've also operated a lot of SSB, RIDI, and in recent years, digital. I've done a lot of stuff in ham radio, including chasing grids on VHF, building equipment, working EME moon bounce on two meters, working all states on 14 bands, working all 488 USA grids on six meters and operating the expeditions from countries such as Hawaii, Belize, Bonaire, US Virgin Islands, St. Bartholomew, St. Eustatius, St. Martin, Easter Island, British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands. I always come back to my passion, which is DX. So what is DX? How do I get started? DX means distance. So working DX is the art and sport of working distance stations. You can chase DX on the VHF, UHF bands by trying to work new grids or states. But I think what we are emphasizing today is the traditional pursuit of DX on the HF bands which means working new DXCC countries, also known as entities. The first step is to get at least a general class license. This will give you the privilege to operate on a much expanded range of HF frequencies over the tech license. If you wanna do serious DX and start with an upgrade to general, it's not that hard. Okay, what equipment do I need? Well, any modern 100 watt low band transceiver will get you started. The rig should have two VFOs so you can operate split when needed. That is your transmit frequency is on VFO B and your receive frequency is on VFO A, for example. I would suggest not starting with a QRP five watt radio. It will only lead to frustration. QRP is fine, it's a challenge, but it's a specialized mode and difficult. Uh, starting out, you will have much more success making QSOs with 100 watts than with QRP. Antennas are the most important part of your station. You can work a lot of stuff on a dipole or vertical, but the world will open up to you with a Yagi or beam of some kind. I would suggest you try to find a used tribe bander or five band Yagi as soon as you can. The five band wire hex beams are popular these days. I use one on my de-expeditions. They work good. Try to get your antenna up 35 or 40 feet. You will be amazed at what you can hear. Eventually you'll probably want an amplifier. Spend your money on antennas first antennas are more important than the amp. The most important technique to learn in DXing is listening. Tune the bands, listen, listen, listen. It's a great way to learn. What modes do I use for DXing? The traditional single side band and CW modes are still good. I'm a CW guy, but the new digital WSJTX mode, FT8, is definitely where you will find 
and be able to work the most DX these days. Many old timers are not real thrilled with FT8 saying it's too automated, too much computer to computer. But a DXer goes where the DX is. The DX today is on FT8. In fact, statistics are showing that about 50% of all QSOs today are on FT8. You will need to interface your computer to your radio and install the free WSJTX software. You can get this <coughs> software at the WSJT website or just Google WSJTX and search for the latest version. FT8 is a weak signal mode, not necessarily a low power QRP mode. You can work a lot of stuff with 100 watts and a simple antenna. QSOs are quick. You exchange call signs, signal reports, and you're in the log. There are, <clears throat> there are specific frequencies on each band for FT8, such as 14074, 18100, and 21074. So you can monitor the FT8 frequency and get a good picture of where the band is open to, Europe, Asia, stateside, etc. One of my slides is a screenshot of the WSJTX FT8 software. The best DX bands year in and year out are 17 and 20 meters. The sunspot spike, the sunspot cycle is just now starting to turn again. In the next three or four years, 10 and 12 meters will come alive with DX every day. 40 meters is good at night. Sunspots and DX and H HF propagation is influenced by the 11 year sunspot cycle and how many sunspots the sun has had lately. The more sunspots, the easier DXing is. Why? The higher the sunspot count, the more bands like 10, 12, and 15 meters are open. In higher sunspots, working the world with modest setups on 10 meters is easy. In low sunspots, working anything on 10 can be a challenge. But 40, 30, 20, 17, and even 15 meters are useful for DX year in and year out. So pick the right band for current conditions and time of day. You can work a lot of interesting DX at any point of the sunspot cycle. Awards, tracking operating achievements. DXers are like baseball players. We count everything. How many countries we have worked on CW on 80 meters. How many SSB countries we have worked on 20 meters. How many mixed mode countries we have confirmed on all bands. There are awards, certificates, or plaques you can apply for as you accumulate the confirmations for your QSOs. Most DXers have at least a few award certificates on the shack wall. Goals for the beginning DXer that are fun and reasonable include the DXCC award given by the ARRL when you have 100 DXCC entities confirmed. Then you add to it with endorsements as you work your way up. WAZ Work All Zones Award is another popular award. SRL maintains a DXCC list, which today contains 340 current entities plus deleted entities. The world is divided up into 40 CQ zones for the WAZ Award. I mentioned confirmations. A written confirmation is a QSL card. Hams have been exchanging QSL cards for as long as there has been ham radio. It's fun. I still like to get paper QSL cards. You can send your QSL direct or via the bureau system. A new confirmation method today is LOTW, the logbook of the world provided by ARL. You and your QSO partner upload the QSO information to an ARL server. If the information matches, you have a confirmed QSO. It's quick, easy, and free. Use DX contests to add to your totals. There is some kind of contest on just about every weekend. 
contest QSOs are quick and easy and a good way to pick up a new one. An online listing of this week's and future contests is available at contesting.com. Watch the DX bulletins for DX edition announcements. Be ready to work them. Some of these online bulletins are uh, dxworld.net, dxnews.com, the Ohio Pen DX Bulletin, and the ARRL DX Bulletin. There are also many online DX cluster sites which provide real-time spotting of DX stations. There are many telnet sites plus some websites such as dxwatch.com, and dxsummit.fi. I've included a slide with listings of these URLs for contesting bulletins and DX cluster sites. The expeditions. Most DX expeditions operate split. Listen to the ops instructions. He will usually say up one or up five or QRZ up, etc. Pay attention. Don't transmit or tune up on his transmit frequency. Listen for the station he just worked. Call on that station's frequency or up or down one or two. Listen for and determine the de-expedition ops operating pattern. He might be working three or four stations in a row up five. Then he moves his listening frequency up five more, works a few more, then starts over back down five. Figure out what he is doing and know where to call. Again, listening is the key to successful DXing rather than just calling blindly. <clears throat> Pileups. Pileups occur when a sufficiently rare station comes on and several stations begin calling him. What do you do? <clears throat> well, you listen. There's that word again, listen, for the operator's instructions. If he is a good op, he will tell you what to do. For example, on SSB, if the pileup is not too large and if the DX station is loud enough to be heard over those calling him, he might just stay on one frequency for transmit and receive and work stations one after another, like W5ABC or 59. Then he gets a report from W5ABC and the QSO is complete. Then the DX moves on to the next station. He can copy and gives him a report. This is fine as long as the DX station can keep control of the pileup. Oftentimes, if the pileup is large, it gets out of control. So the DX operator has to use other techniques. He might announce he is going by call areas and only answering calls with a one in them for a while. He'll make six or eight QSOs of ones, then go on to twos, etc. Another technique is going split. The DX station will transmit on one frequency and announce he is listening up or listening up five to 10. So then you would also listen with your other VFO for the station he is working. And when he finishes, you call the DX on that frequency. Working the DX in a pileup takes a little skill. First, you listen to his instructions and observe his routine. Then you park your transmit BFO on a spot where you have a good chance of getting through. Getting through the, to the DX in a big pileup with multitudes calling definitely favors the big gun with power and big antennas. But you can make the QSO if propagation is favorable and you pick the right spot to transmit. As a beginner, if you find you aren't enjoying the pileup, if you can't really figure out what's happening, or you have been calling for 30 minutes or more, you might want to just tune up the band and find something that is easier to work and come back to the pileup later. CW pileups are similar, except they usually don't have as big a split in frequency. Usually the CWDX will listen up one or two. It's easier to break the pileup on CW with low power and a wire or vertical antenna. Okay, I'm going to change my um, change to the other PowerPoint here. Okay. 
Okay, can you see this one okay? Uh, we, see the, uh, we see the screen with the PowerPoint on it. Yep. And 1S, 1DX? Correct. Okay. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few QSL cards um, since that's what we are after as DXers. 1S, 1DX is uh, a card from the Spratly, uh, Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. 3Y0PI is uh, Peter the First Island down in Antarctica. 3Y5X is uh, Bouvet, the second most rare country in the world. The last two or three expeditions uh, to Bouvet have failed. The, the boat uh, uh, had uh, trouble or weather and uh, didn't make it and turned back. 7J1RL is Okano, Tarishima. It's uh, That is a country right there. The rocks barely out of the water. Uh, it's been deleted now. 8Z4Alpha is the Saudi Iraq neutral zone, which has also been deleted. And this is a pretty card from uh, Nepal, 9N7AN. One of the newer uh, Entities is Swains Island near Samoa, KH8SI, pretty high on the needed list. This is a card from my uh, operation on St. Bart's FJ stroke K5WE. FO0XC Clipperton off of Mexico. HK0A8 Baja Nuevo in the Caribbean. That same group of operators next went to HK0AA Serana Bank, a, near, a nearby island in the Caribbean. Palmyra KIP, a, a US possession in the Pacific. This is another card from Palmyra K6 LPL stroke KH5. And that is a picture of the de-expedition plane, which crash landed upon uh, uh, arriving on the island. Uh, all the de-expeditioners survived. Uh, the plane did not. It's still there. This is my card from uh, Hawaii, KH6 stroke K5WE. Uh, China for a long time was uh, did not have any operator, did not allow any operators. And one of the first that they did allow was BY4AA. And now there's uh, there's lots of them on from China. Abu Ail is uh, an island off of Yemen in the Red Sea. OE6XG stroke A, that has been deleted. And the rarest country in the world, P5 stroke 4L4 FN, North Korea. Uh, this, this guy was a Russian that was working in North Korea for a period of time and they let him get on the air. It's uh, ham radio has always been very restricted. There have been very few operations from North Korea, probably uh, less than 15,000 QSOs ever made from there. So it's right at the top of the wanted list uh, for everybody. This is uh, my card from Bon Air, PJ4 stroke K5WE. And my card from uh, St. Eustatius, PJ5. And my card from St. Martin, PJ7. SM0AGD stroke KH1 is uh, now counts for Baker Howland um, in the uh, uh, American Phoenix uh, was what it was back then. And uh, this was Eric Solzland from uh, Sweden, a uh, uh, famous de expeditioner from the early days. And this was another of his opera, Eric's operations from Bangladesh. 
my card from Belize, V31WE, my card from St. Croix from the Virgin Islands, KP2 stroke K5WE, Maldives, 8Q7AM in the Indian Ocean, BK9GN was uh, one of my first uh, kind of rare uh, contacts with the territory of New Guinea, which has now been deleted and uh, reformed as Papua New Guinea. Uh, the two countries merged. Uh, this was uh, a group of uh, missionaries that were there in New Guinea translating the Bible into uh, the native languages. My card from uh, British Virgin Islands, and my card from Easter Island, XR0YS. That was probably my favorite trip. I made uh, 13,000 QSOs in 10 days. Had a lot of fun. It was a good trip, Easter Island. This is uh, a group of Russians that operated from Myanmar, XY0RR. That's my card from the Cayman Islands, ZF2WE. ZL8R is uh, Raoul Island in the Kermadec chain, uh, possession of uh, New Zealand. Uh, Raoul Island is, has an active volcano. Um, the last, last it erupted was in 2006. There was a group of five New Zealand scientists uh, resident on the island and one of them was killed in that uh, in that eruption. VU7LD is Lakshadweep, also known as Lakadives off of India, very rare. This is a screenshot of the WSJTEX uh, FT8 software. Um, if it, the, the ones in green are calling CQ. If you're in QSO, they'll show up red um, it's pretty simple. I, I don't know if this shows up real good, but over here is the, the standard message is, uh, you send calls, calls and your grid square and then calls and, uh, a signal report in DBs over, over or under the noise level. Um, and, uh, then Rogers and 73s and you're in the log. Um, and this is uh, uh, some traces of signals that you can uh, see and sometimes not even hear in the speaker, but still copy and uh, make a QSO with. The band pass is typically about three kilocycles. Uh, you can get a lot, of, a lot of signals in there. Uh, it's a good mode, very popular these days, and uh, you can make a lot of uh, QSOs with a lot of DX stations. Here's some of the URLs I mentioned. Uh, the WSJT software can be downloaded from the WSJT site. The DX bulletins, dxworld.net, dxnews.com, Ohio pin, uh, DX bulletin, and the ARL bulletins, DX clusters, dxwatch.com, dxsummit.fi, and uh, contesting.com. Um, a couple of books on DXing. Uh, it was uh, announced today on dxworld.net that uh, Marty Lane's book, Where Do We Go Next?, is available for download uh, for free as a PDF. So uh, he uh, he wrote this, uh, and it's it's kind of old, 1991, but it, it was uh, kind of a book about his DX and the uh, expeditioning adventures, and has been uh, kind of an inspiration to generations of DXers. Um, so check it out. It's uh, it's a good book. Another book is uh, Bob Lochner's The Complete DX. 
Um, okay. So, um, to conclude, to, so to the people who think they're not having enough fun on two meters, get out there and try something new like DXing. You'll find yourself captivated. To me, this is real ham radio. Join the adventure. It's too much fun and too fulfilling to miss out on. I must warn you though, chasing DX is addictive. Working a new one may become a lifelong pursuit that never gets old. Ham radio is a great hobby. There are many things to pursue within the hobby. For me, DXing is number one. It never gets old. The thrill of the chase and the satisfaction of finally working that rare station on the other side of the world is as much fun now as it was 54 years ago. So give it a try, have fun, become a DXer, work the world, DX is. Thank you, 73, and good DX. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, we're gonna move right on with Kim, uh, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about DXing. Okay, let's see how this works. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, here I am. I'm the president of the Oklahoma DX Association. So, and kind of what got me into radio is a lot of the same things that Mark mentioned, or Jeff mentioned rather. And that is that there's just something magical about talking to somebody, communicating with somebody on the other side of the world using a radio that produces about as much power as a 100 watt light bulb, a wire, some rarefied air, living in a place with a magnetic field, and a nice star nearby. There's just, there's just something about that, that that I've always been captivated by. And so that was one of the things that, that kind of got me in, and I've always liked it. DX is, <laughs> comes from a guy named Hugh Cassidy, WA6AUD, who wrote, would write little parable columns in the uh, West Coast DX Bulletin many, many years ago. And there was a list of characters. There was the old timer. He was the guy who lived at the top of the hill. You'd always go to him. People, the, 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 uh, the locals, there were the QRPers, there was uh, Red Eyed Louie, and there was there this cast of characters. And they would come, the, the QRPers were, were the ones that would come up with, a, with this great new idea. And they would go up and the old timer was kind of an enigmatic fellow, patient and impatient all at the same time, would, would finally give you an answer that itself was enigmatic and then turn back to do whatever he was doing. And that would be that. So it was a fun call. And DX is, is kind of like, well, it's whatever it needs to be. So... Well, why do we bother with this stuff? Uh, does that show? I hope that shows up better for you than it there than it does for me. But in any event, maybe oh, that's better. Well, aside from the romance of talking to somebody else from a different culture on the other side of the world, there's just something about wireless communications over long distances, and it's part of our job. As amateurs, there's there's these, these this set of of things. Why is there amateur radio? Communication and extension of the amateur's unique ability to enhance international goodwill. Can't ever have too much of that. And that's one of our jobs. That's one of the reasons we get this huge chunk of spectrum to use as we see fit. So well. It began, DX began with Marconi. 19 December, what did I just say? I forget, anyway. 
1901, where he sent one way a signal from Poldhu Cold, uh, Cornwall to Signal Hill in Canada. I want you to think about this for a minute because we already had transatlantic cables at the time. Why did we bother? The transatlantic cables had all kinds of technical issues. One of the technical issues was the signal rate was about one quarter of a character per minute. This, there's technical reasons why. So Marconi saw that if I could do this faster, I will be rich beyond the dreams of avarice. He wasn't so much into radio. He was an entrepreneur. And so he wanted to show that, in fact, you could do this. You could talk, go a long ways. You could talk a long ways. And on, in December 1901, he believed he had heard S, three dits, sent from a special, horrifically expensive transmitter that he built in Poultry, Cornwall, to Signal Hill in Canada. Later analysis shows he probably didn't. But by 1903, he certainly did, and he was still the only one to have done it. It was all done with spark. And the thing was, well, how far will your station reach? Today, that's kind of a silly question. My station will reach to the other side of the world. I will reach to the moon and back. But back then, that was an important question. Typical stations that amateurs had could go 50 miles on a, on a typical day. For really good day, maybe 75 but they were spark transmitters and we didn't have the kind of equipment that we have today. Their receiver was <laughs> deaf as a post. <laughs> deaf as a post by our standards. Imagine the first guy that did this was Hertz, who did it kind of as a curiosity as a physicist. He had this spark transmitter and he had a tuned loop on the other side of the room. How did that receiver work? If he sent a spark, he saw a spark over there. That's how strong the signals were. By today's standards, they were astonishingly strong. Marconi had this thing called a coherer. I won't go into it, but it still required a very strong signal. It was a weird gadget. And so when you sent this spark, it would, would ring a tuned circuit. They understood tuned circuits. Ring a tuned circuit, hooked to an antenna very broad banded, but the coherer would all of a sudden conduct and you'd hear a, a click in your headphones. But once it conducted, it was stuck. So you had to tap it. So they had a little, a little hammer that would vibrate against the side of this coherer. So what you actually heard was a buzz at the, at the rate of that hammer. You couldn't send very fast, about the fastest anybody could go was about 15 words per minute because you couldn't determine the, char the, the character elements any faster than that. Ham radio was going great until World War I. World War I came around and the military needed it and the Navy in particular needed it and all the ham stations were sh shut down. And I mean shut down. You had to have a seal applied by a city, of, by some government official around your equipment. You had to take down your antennas. You couldn't even receive any. That's what I meant by shutdown. Afterwards, when amateurs finally got, the, got their privileges back, they were relegated to the, the wavelengths of 200 meters, 200 meters and less. Because everyone knew that at wavelengths smaller than 200 meters, it was worthless. There's no radio at wavelengths smaller than 200 meters. And so give them that. Except that we discovered the hams discovered that, no, we could, we could go a long way on, the sh on these short waves, less than 200 meters. So the amateurs discovered the short waves. It had been known for a while that we had this, this ionosphere, a couple of guys, a couple of physicists, Kennel, by the name of Kennelly and Heaviside, one in the US, one in the, one in the UK, kind of simultaneously worked this out. And it was determined that, by golly, you know, that stuff will refract radio waves if they're at the right wavelength. And so the very, the, since Marconi had made it commercially across the Atlantic, the hands made it in 1921. The ARRL sent the guy to the UK by the name of Paul Godley. His call at the time was 2EZ. There were no prefixes. There were just numbers and a suffix because 
you couldn't talk to another country, so you, it didn't matter. But some because we couldn't go far enough. And if you were close enough to another country that you were talking to somebody in it, well, you knew where they were anyway, so there was no mystery. So he was sent to the UK with the latest in receiver technology, a super heterodyne receiver using, a, using vacuum tubes. He was sent there to receive signals from a specially set up transmitter in Connecticut, whose call was one BCG. And he heard him from December 7th to December 16th, 1921. That was the first successful known amateur spanning of the Atlantic. Bunch of other signals were heard, but the breakthrough was actually received technology. There, was also, there were also problems with RFI to broadcast AM broadcast radio. So, well, who's a DXer? We've kind of already covered this. DX covers more than HF bands. I'm going to talk mainly about the HF bands because that's what I do and that's what I know. But there's a tremendous amount of stuff that goes on on VHF and UHF. Six meters. You can get DX, you can do 100 entities on six meters if you really work at it. And we're coming into a time now when it's actually worth spending time with it. Because six meters is... is People think 10 meters is hard. Oh, six meters is harder. And then there's other things that can be done with VHF, which I'll cover briefly. But DX, I want to make, I want to make a point here. DX is relative. DX is relative to the, to the wavelength and frequency that you're using. On VHF and UHF, D, you know, DX is like you know, several states away. Uh, or, or it could be Earth, Moon, Earth. EME, kind of the ultimate DX. I talked to somebody, you know, on, on, in, in a different country by bouncing my signal off of the moon and back. That's pretty good DX. Um, so how do we go for, oh, there was one there. But, okay, let's talk about antennas. We covered that briefly, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about antennas. There aren't any magic antennas. Anyone tells you they got the perfect antenna, turn around and walk away and save your money. There are no magic antennas, no isotrons, no super light bulbs. There are no magic antennas. Rule number one. Rule number two, there are no best antennas. There is not one kind of antenna that is the best antenna in the world and you've got to use that. There aren't any, none, zero, zip. Every antenna is a compromise in some way. Can you fit it in? Can you maintain it? How much money do you want to spend on it? Every antenna is a compromise. But there's another rule. Big antennas up high work better than small antennas down low. Sorry, size matters. But any antenna is better than no antenna. So one last thing is random wires aren't random. Mark, can I actually click on a URL with this gadget? Okay, this is a neat page, and I put the URL up or go scan down a little bit. Uh, scroll down. Oh, okay, here we are. This is a great page because random wires are pretty good antennas. I've used them before, I used them a lot. But it turns out they're not really random. There are certain lengths that you must avoid, and those lengths are, are integral numbers of half wavelengths. Because if you don't avoid those, you're going to have trouble getting it to tune. You're at a very high impedance point. And antenna tuners don't like that. So this is a great page that talks about if you want to cover these bands or this band or this band, anywhere in the white are lengths to avoid. Don't use those. Don't use those because you're, you're going to invite problems. So let's go back to the presentation. I just wanted to show you that. It'll be in the presentation. It's also on our antenna. Huh? Oh, okay, great. Great, great, great. Okay. Excellent. So... So let's go to the next one here. Okay, here's a very interesting guy. Jim Richardson from the Oklahoma DX Association. This is his station. It's a modest DX station. Let's take a look at it. Well, first you got, you got to have an operator. There he is. It's an older set of stations. It's with an old computer, old, old it's an uh, it's ICOM 7, 61, I think, is what he has. 
He has a tribander on his, he had a tribander on his chimney, another one for 17 and 12 meters on a, on a short tower. With this, over the years, he worked 330 countries. Big antennas up high work better than small antennas down low, but any antenna is better than no antenna. So with a wire and 100 watts, you can work 100 countries, 100 entities. You can work 200 entities. You can work as many as you, as, as you want, but you're not going to do it fast. Big antennas and amplifiers make it faster, but they don't, they're not what make it possible. You can do this with 100 watts and a wire. Don't, don't, don't let anybody talk you out of that. Here's something I had. I was off, I was off on a uh, field project in Salina, Kansas, a project called Pecan. And I was on one of the radars, but we were only going out at night because we were after these big thunderstorm complexes that come over at night. And I was in a dorm uh, on, a, on a college on the second floor. I knew I was where I was going to be, and I thought, yeah, I, field day's coming, and I just got, I'll, I'll bring my radio. So I brought my radio. There's my TS-930S. There's my keyer. There's my tuner. There's my paddles. There's the laptop that I had. That's what I had. Oops. I didn't do that. This is where my antenna went. There's a window here right there. And so I went to Walmart and I bought a towel and I rolled it up and I stuffed it under the window and closed the window on it because I didn't want bugs to get in and I had to go through the screen. So I took the, so, and see that? That's my antenna right there. Here's a little nine to one transformer that I bought. Here's the counterpoise and here's the antenna going out to a tree, magnet wire. I made it in a couple hours. You know, I got this whole thing set up in a couple hours. What did I do with it? I worked field day. My goal was to make 100, 100 contacts on field day one evening because I knew we weren't going to go out that, that, that night. Being a meteorologist, I, we can forecast the weather. Don't let anybody fool you. And, and so I, had to, I, had, I could do this on field day. But other evenings and other days when I wasn't deployed, I would work some DX. And this was uh, few, several years ago, so the sunspots were in the tank. But I could still work the DX. I probably had six or seven DX stations just in the time I had to operate with this setup. So simple works. You don't need the latest and greatest and most expensive and highest power amplifier and, and Yagi's at 300 feet to make it go. You can do it with this. Technique is worth a lot. It's the technique that will get you, that you, get you the, the context. Jeff covered a little bit of it. It comes with experience. Listen. you got to listen. <laughs> we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You've got to listen. On CW, which is my preferred mode, the, the DX station is usually about two to five kilohertz below the pileup. If it's a rare station, as, as Jeff pointed out, it, it's going to operate split. This is so the calling stations aren't on top of the DX station. It makes the pile up easier to control. So they'll operate split. On CW, the splits are pretty narrow. On single sideband, the splits are wider because the mode is wider. And many times in single sideband, the DX station will be below our phone band. Why would they do that? So we're not on top of them because the U.S. by far has the most active amateurs in the world. And so then that, that pileup will be up like eh, somewhere in the phone band someplace, maybe 20 kilohertz away. So when you run across this roaring mob, that's a pileup. Roaring mob on single sideband, roaring mob on CW, that's a pileup. Somewhere away from that, not in the middle of it, is DX that's, that's rare enough to get people's attention. So that's part of the technique. Knowing what this is comes from experience. Listen, you gotta listen. You gotta turn on the radio and listen and look for this stuff. It's not bad, it's not terrible, it's not, it's not 
hurtful to do this. It's not, I mean, if, if you enjoy radio and you enjoy stuff, this is fun. This is fun. So, so the code, there's kind of a code of conduct. We said this before, listen, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Call only if you can hear the DX station. You'd be astonished how many people will call the DX station. They can't hear them, but they know they're there. It sounds crazy. Uh, don't trust the DX cluster to tell you what the call is because people miscopy it. You can copy the call. Listen to this guy. Who is it really? Uh, don't interfere. Don't, don't call on top of the DX while they're, while they're talking to somebody else. Just don't. Um, wait for them to end a contact before your call and always send a full call. So don't, if it, you know, I, I, and sometimes I'll call a DX station and they'll send P question mark. Well, okay, there's a P in my call. So I'll send my call. If he sent C question mark or N4 question mark, I sit on my hands because it's not me. Or especially if he says W4 question mark or something like, it's not me. So wait until he's actually, you think he's actually got a partial on you and then, and then go ahead and call him. Uh, if they say, give me only the region four calls, don't call him. Wait, wait your turn. Uh, and then be thankful if and when you make the contact be, because I mean, you thank the guy because this is this is hard. This is hard from the other end. Don't be an inconsiderate jerk. Just don't. <laughs> you know, everyone knows what an inconsiderate jerk is, and don't be one. It's not that important. DXing is not contesting, and contesting is not DXing, but the two do intersect. A lot of DXers relish the ensuing QSO as much as they. There's the chase and others love the chase. I like them both. Contesting is focusing on just running as many contacts as you can with someplace, not this, not this entity. So it does Canada, Mexico, Hawaii, Alaska. These are all entities. Um, but, but contesting is not necessarily DXing. However, you can work a whole bunch of entities during a good DX contest. And I mean, a bunch of them. Uh, I think Mark found that on just listening on FT8 over a weekend, he heard over a hundred countries and if you can hear them on FT8, you can probably work them. During a CQ worldwide contest, especially with the sunspots is coming up as they are now, if you're diligent, you can work DXCC in a weekend. So, so contests are useful. Contests are fun. I'm going to make a pitch for contests because they make you a better operator. I don't like contests are too hard. Come on. Under bad circumstances and emergency situations, you'll need every bit of the skill that you learn how to man that you learn in a contest, how to manage weak signals, how to manage interference, how to manage noise, how to manage all this stuff. You'll learn in a contest when all that really counts is a score. In an emergency situation, in an emergency situation, a lot more may count besides just your score. So contests are good exercises. I can't say enough good about them because of that. DX clusters, there's lots of DX. And there's a reverse beacon network. Go to the reverse beacon network, uh, Mark. Who has been active on CW recently? Okay, Bing, anybody else? I don't care whether you were fast or slow. Or whether you're just on for a while. Okay, let's put Bing. All right, go to go to DX spots. Uh, up by the no, not downloads. DX spots. No, no, no. Wow, there he is, right there. In five, in I five G. You were actually go. Let's let's go to DX spots. Uh, it's on. It's right below the green line. Reverse beacon network. It's the second one to the to the right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here, here. It's it's this. Okay. Go, click on. Okay. Put in put in Bing's call sign.
and I find the, the, well, no, go, go back to, you know, right. But go and go to, cause you're going to see every time it, anybody heard it, go to DX spots. Oh, I'm sorry. Go down to spot search. Now put an NI 5G and search. Well, okay. The only one that heard you when you're on, oh, that's why. On the 11th of June was KD7YZ. Uh, go to, N, go, go, go to uh, W5RG. Ah, now all of these are stations that are running DX skimmers and that's only 15 of them. Go up here and, and look at more, like uh, up, up, see rows to show. You are your own beacon. All of these DX skimmers heard Bob and you, there will be DX in there if we look at enough of them. Oh, these are US stations. Uh, but if they're, but it's a good way you can you can filter these in a way that you can see who's not in your in your country that heard you. So you are your own beacon. Who can hear you? If what what DX can hear you? Um, so the reverse beacon network. Yeah, this works with RIDI. Uh, it works with CW. It works. I think it works with FT8. So any of those modes, you, you, will, be, you will be spotted by, by the skimmer stations. Who are you going to look for? H7. Who's that? AZQ? Oh, okay. I don't think it... Uh, Okay, no, it does not. It does not. There are other, I mean, FT8 has its own magic things. QSLing. Come on, use logbook of the world. Uh, now, now, I love getting QSLs from exotic places. And if you, and that's, a, that's how everybody used to do it. it was, but it's 2021. It. Yeah, but this is 2020. And, and I still enjoy it, but it costs money. It costs money because it's going to cost you a buck to send the card someplace. And you're gonna to have to then, because there are so many of us compared to the, to the desirable DX out there, you're gonna to have to throw in a couple of $3 into that envelope because they have to buy their cards, they have to maintain their station off and, and they have to, then they have to provide the postage on the way back, which is often more expensive there than it is here. So let's, you know, your cards aren't, aren't, aren't free. Your post, if you do this with QSL cards for, for a DXCC, you're going to be spending upwards of 500 bucks on getting those QSL cards back and you won't get every one back. You can use the Bureau and how to do that is, is well documented. Basically, you send a pile of cards to the Bureau and they're all bundled up by the league and set off as freight. And then they're redistributed to all the countries that those cards that, 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 that are in that thing your goes to the country's bureaus and then they distribute the cards to their amateurs this takes a long time i mean it's great it's wonderful to get a envelope full of new cards but it takes a long time because then they have to they do the same thing sending it back to us and our bureau has to redistribute it bureaus are wonderful i love them but they take a long time logbook of the world is 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 marvelous because it's it's very low cost. It's not exactly free, but it's a couple of bucks. And, and it's all done electronically. So I have a pile of QSL cards at home, not anywhere equivalent to Jeff's. But, but, and, and he's got some gorgeous cards. But I have a pile of QSL cards at home. And if I really want that country and I think there's something cool about it, then I'll send a QSL card and expect to get one back. But I, if they also do log with the world, I will happily... Confirm the QSO with logbook of the world. So the DXCC was started by a guy named Clinton DeSoto in the league, and he made up the basic rules, and it's still fundamentally the same today. That's what the, that's what the certificate looks like. There are, there are 340 countries 
There's 16 separate awards. There's the honor roll. An honor roll requires at least 330 or more current entries, or I think it may be 331 now. And there's other kinds of things. And then there's VUCC, which is for VHF and UHF, Oops. which is, uh, and there's awards for that. This is the Fred Fish Award. Only five have ever made it. But this is where you work every one of those grid squares, all 448 of them, on VHF or UHF. Often it's done on six meters. There's only five people that have ever done that. That counts as DX. That's DX. That's DXing. So that counts. What's, what kind of facilities are there to support you in this? Well, there's this club. There's people like me. There's also the Oklahoma DX Association, which is filled with honor roll uh, people that have made it to the honor roll. There's several members that have worked them all. I mean, worked them all. And then some, and a bunch of deleted entities. It's, uh, it's the D Oklahoma DX Association is not expensive. One of the things it does is, is help fund the expeditions of the 100 most wanted top 100 most wanted countries because these day the expeditions aren't cheap. You heard about Beauvais Island, the three Y zero the expeditions. There's two failed ones. It's out in the middle of the South Atlantic in the, in the roaring forties and, and the boats broke and it became a life threatening situation. They had to get them back before, before more of it broke. And it's an extremely difficult place to get to. For DXing purposes, it's very desirable because it's like the second most wanted country. You want to make it to honor roll, you got to get all these guys. So it's, it's a competitive thing in that regard. But these things are <laughs> hideously expensive. Uh, I believe there was the, the latest really big one that failed was racked up a bill of something like $700,000. So this isn't just, you know, bringing your radio with you in, to Cancun on your vacation. This, these are like dedicated operations. So that's part of what DX clubs do. I'm the president. Obviously, if you'd like to become a member, talk to me. Uh, there's some books on DXing that I will. There's the complete DXer, which uh, Jeff mentioned this. And this is a great book. It's just a great book. It's a fun read. It's well written. There's another one called DX Power. This has some different tips in it, but the two are quite complementary. So if you want to read about this stuff, you know, and, and enjoy with an enjoyable book, either of these are, are, are good choices. I'm done. There you have it. Oh, and I'll, I'll take questions. Any questions? I did not do a good enough job that there are no questions. And, and, and I will ascribe to the maxim that there are no stupid questions, though I have had incidents where this. Yes, Bing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, piggyback on that. I think that DXing is also a part of history. Oh, yeah, clearly. One of my greatest contacts and cards was from Georgetown before they all committed suicide oh, geez. and they wrote on he typed a letter like on my card and it just you know it, it jones chills jonestown. jonestown jonestown yes yeah. yes jonestown so it, it's part of history yeah i mean uh, uh there was one back here yeah yeah well, um, uh, I don't. <laughs> uh, I, 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 Jeff, did, did you hear? You may not have heard the question. Jeff, you do FT8. And how much, what's your split in time spent between FT8 and CW? Uh, <laughs> these days, uh, it's probably, honestly, 90% FT8 because that's where the QSOs are. That's where the DX is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that one mode's better than another. It's just, I- I, I, I would much rather be on CW because yeah. it's more fun for me. But uh, the DX is on FD8. 
uh, including six my... meters, which is what's on my window there. Ah, that's six meters live. Yeah, how, cra how crazy is that? Yeah. Um, one of you being mentioned a memorable QSO, I'll, I'll mention one. Uh, it was didn't count as a DX country, but it was a guy who was maritime mobile out in the middle of the uh, North Atlantic on a merchant marine. A Russian, he and his family were planning a, a vacation to the United States, to Yellowstone National Park. Had never been here before. And this was still during the Cold War, although things were, were, were warming up uh, in a good way. <laughs> so the Cold War was, was abating. And this was at a time when uh, the big forest fires in Yellowstone were top of the news. And he was concerned that after all these years and all his planning and all of his efforts that Yellowstone would be all burned up and there would be nothing to see. And so I explained to him that no, it was only a very tiny small part of Yellowstone that got burned up. I got a card from him. Uh, I don't know whether he ever went or not. I assume he did and I assume he had a good time, but it was nice to be able to reassure somebody that no, it's still there. It's, it's still nice to see. And, and none of the really, none of the things that you'll hear much about got damaged. Uh, I have a couple of Russian rubles, which were at the time illegal to, to mail to anyone, but they did it anyway, because this was <laughs> about the time the USSR was, was, was coming apart. And, and, and so I would send them a green stamp, which they weren't supposed to possess, and they would send me a ruble. <laughs> yes. You may repeat this so others can hear it. Uh, back to the thing of when, when your call zone is called. Yeah. And when they call for W fives, yeah, he left. Dean over there is a, is a six call, but he's limiting five. No, they they, they they want the number, not the region. They yeah. want the number, not yeah. the region. That's what everybody always asks. Yeah, them. right. When they ask for six calls, they want a six in your call. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you really are because they understand that. They just want a six in your call. It's a way to pare things down so they can manage it better. This isn't, this isn't always in a net. This could be just within a pileup and it's a way for the DX station to try to control the pileup if it starts getting really big. They said, I only want to hear from, from sixes, which is it's, it's a huge bunch. But, uh, but yeah, he may say, I only uh, oh, six calls only, please. Which means I don't care if you live in California. If you have a two in your call, you're not a six. Any others? Great. Thanks very much. All right, let's thank uh, Jeff, uh, who's virtual with us, and Kim, who's here in the room again, one more time. Okay, we've had uh, some other folks sneak in. Uh, so uh, if you weren't here for the initial round of introductions, would you uh, tell us who you are? Is there anybody else I tried to watch? And I think we probably, uh, we've got some new ones on, uh, on uh, the virtual side. I see Larry and Chad uh, is with us and probably some others who I'm just missing here. All right, very good. At this time, uh, let's, uh, we're gonna move right along and I'm gonna hand the mic over to Mark, which is a mistake, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're gonna do a wrap up of field day. <laughs> always a big, always a big mistake. No, I turned it off. I, I didn't wanna listen to me. Actually, that's only one of the three recordings that was happening. And so two of them are still running. Um, my sponsor supposed to talk about Field Day. Uh, field Day is the ultimate non-DX DX event. And uh, we had uh, a non yeah, non-contest contest, exactly. If you're keeping score, it's a contest. That's all I'm going to say. But the problem is well, who you're competing against. That's always the tough part of Field Day. We had a wonderful Field Day. Uh, I see a lot of faces out here on both lo uh, Zoom and uh, local that were here. If you were here, I hope you all had a great time. Um, if you weren't here, next year is going to be good for it. If you went home and did some efforts 
on your own, please make sure you record your scores with the club name of South Canadian ARS. We had last time I checked six um, stations that had done some work at home. We appreciate all the efforts. It's really cool to show up in QST in December with a lot of uh, good support. But it, has to, it has to be that order. It has to be South Canadian ARS. Um, the, the, the folks at headquarters are, are pretty good at, at scanning for that. Um, on, on this event, they said they, they kind of group them manually. Uh, but uh, uh, if you have one that you know is wrong, let me know. And I know the guy to go fix it. So uh, not, a, not a fatal mistake if something's wrong. We had a couple last year that had just different spelling and we got it fixed. Um, but I think it's a cool way to do it, to aggregate some stuff. I know that uh, we had some folks out at the lake and, and at their houses and all kinds of neat things. And, and they got as wet as we did, I think is the right answer. We, we all stayed out of it. We had three stations, Sideband, CW, and um, uh, Data. Uh, we had, what, 199 Data? 166 data, 199 on sideband, and uh, Morris, what'd you get? Where's Bob? I don't remember your name. 413. 413. See, I can't count that high, so I have to ask Bob to do that. The CW guys blow it away every time, and that's just so much fun to do. Um, DX expeditions are like doing field day, but you put them all on a boat and go somewhere else. So uh, all the complexity we, that we had here, including feeding and, and taking care of people, they have to do on uh, on the ships. So field day was good. We will do it again in January. We do a winter field day operation. Um, and we will do that at the end of January. If you wish to join it, if you want to help, please let me know. Thank you all for the help. Like I said, I look around the room. I see most of you were there. That was great. Any questions on field day? Any comments? Uh, things we should do different, better? Okay. Huh? I'll go down the whole list. Uh, we started the event at one o'clock where we kicked off transmitting, which was great. Two o'clock, we did a VE test. We had one wonderful, happy customer out there that passed his test in that two o'clock event. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Um, did you get to operate at all? I forgot. No, okay. He was there watching. I know that. Getting all the answers right before the test. That was kind of neat to, to see it all happen and put it in his head before he tested. Uh, we did uh, uh, a, a, a a fox hunt test, uh, fox hunt skills, and put up a transmitter on two meters and chased it around, chased people around the park here. And I think what I remember was 10 seconds before, 10 seconds after they found the transmitter, it started raining. So the timing worked out just great on that, that event. But uh, we chased that event down. We had a, an educational event at three o'clock, which was great on building J pole antennas out of uh, 300 ohm twin, twin lead. Thank you, Lee, for uh, chasing all that through. If you want to continue doing a J antenna, uh, feel free to show up at, at uh, Elmer Night Tuesday nights. We have the equipment, we have the materials, and you can still keep building those and, and uh, take them off running. Uh, we had some wonderful food by, by uh, uh, Phil and Dean, uh, who gave us breakfast, no, lunch, dinner, and breakfast, no, lunch and dinner. And then David Grizzle came through with his chef uh, Saturday, Sunday morning, um, breakfast, which was worth the trip out, I think is the, the big answer out of the deal. Um, so big event. We'll do it again next, uh, January and, uh, thank you all for supporting it. We'll see you again then. Any questions? Super. Thanks. The only question I have is I want to know what Larry's cooking there, uh, on the virtual <laughs> side. <laughs> Thank goodness it's not smell vision All right. Anything else about field day? Any suggestions to make it even better for next time? The, uh, yeah, better weather. Yeah, that's, that's always a, uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know this or haven't been around a while, uh, I know that uh, Bill and Bill and a whole bunch of the rest of you used to do field day out at Reeves Park under a pavilion. And when it looked like it was going to rain, they put tarps up to try and protect the radios. Yeah, that was that was fun. Say again. The club needs to invest in common mode chokes. Try and uh, stand by. 
a, co a common mode choke. Some people call them balans, but they're not really a balan. They're a common mode choke. They prevent common mode currents on the outside of the coax. They're always there and, and we don't want them because they cause problems. And so the club needs to invest in some serious common mode chokes. Three of them at least, uh, they don't need to be high power uh, to, to protect the stations that, that are using it. It'll, it'll reduce the uh, interference between stations and it'll reduce problems with, with the RF in the shack. Not hard to make either. And, oh, and they're, they're really easy to make. Ideally, you put it at the feed point, but it can also go down at, at, at your, at, right at the feed. It go, ideally, it goes to the feed point of the antenna, but you can also put it at where you connect the transmitter. So it, it should be a part of the antenna, but you can kind of put it wherever you can put it. Very good. Anything else? Uh, some of you know that there was a, an emergency management uh, communications exercise that started at 11 on Saturday morning that uh, was run out of the big truck that was out here in front. And we made uh, uh, numerous contacts on both amateur and our public safety stuff. Um, we're still working on trying to, we challenged our EMs to try and send, uh, use non-commercial internet, non-commercial wireless. Um, of course, the voice side of that's easy because you use radio. Uh, the data side's a little harder, and we've uh, challenged our EMs on that, and the EMs have challenged us as well to how do we accomplish that, so we're working on that. Um, we also found a programming error with uh, one of the radios in the big truck and uh, working on correcting that, so that's why we do exercises. Okay, we're going to move right along. Uh, Chris, minutes from last meeting very quickly. Let me get it pull it up here. All right. Okay, we're going to move back to the treasurer and let Chris pull his stuff up first. First of all, as you know, we are just now getting back in from the uh, pandemic issues we had last year. So we haven't had too many expenses uh, or revenue other than dues revenue uh, from last year. But um, so far this year, we're well ahead of membership as we were last year and the previous year. Got a lot of new members this year. Uh, we've got a few members that have not uh, rejoined from last year. Uh, and, and if you know any of those people, please invite them to come back and uh, pay their dues and get caught up. Uh, I'd also like to mention one thing that uh, I've been treasurer since, um, let's turn around here. I've been treasurer since February of 2019. So I'll be almost three years at the end of this year. I've decided to uh, turn the mantle or the, the duties over to somebody else. So I'm looking for some volunteers. It requires just a little bit of experience, mainly a desire and in, in want to get into the details. It takes me about three or four hours a month, and that's, that's the truth, maybe five hours in, in a heavy period the first part of the year. And I will work with the person that decides that they would like to try this. And um, probably the last, you know, two or three months, we'll do it together. Uh, mainly, uh, I've got a list here if anybody's interested of the duties and helpful experience. Uh, it'd be nice if you had some small business experience with some bookkeeping systems. Uh, we use QuickBooks, which is a commercially available accounting package, very simple to use. So anyway, we're looking for volunteers. Uh, one person or two would be nice to uh, uh, to talk to me and uh, to talk to Galen and see if they're interested. It's a very important role. We need to keep up with our membership and uh, the monies and the dues and things like that. So uh, let me know. But so far, uh, the club is in great financial condition. We've got plenty of reserves. We haven't had a budget this year because it's almost impossible to budget during the pandemic. But we will be developing a budget for next year and get the members' approval, hopefully, of the budget for 2022. And uh, really, uh, everything is looking great. The membership is growing. I'm, I'm really surprised at the number of new members. And I, and I really, if I have to blame that on the current members, they're bringing in the new members. So thank you all for, for 
pushing the club, uh, telling people what a great club we have because we have gotten quite a few new members this year. And uh, for those people, uh, I hope they enjoy their experience, enjoy their experience with ham radio. And, you know, for ham radio operators, final comment, for ham radio operators that have been dealing with the sunspot issue uh, where there's very few SSB contacts that you can make compared to what it was, let's say, 10, 12 years ago, it's going to be amazing for these new members when they start hearing things that really they can't believe how, how many contacts they'll be able to get uh, soon. Right now, it's a little trying. You can still get through. You can have plenty of contacts. But think about that multiply it times 10 times easier, So, in my opinion. So anyway, great club. And I really would like to find somebody that would be interested in volunteering. If you know somebody, please ask them to see me or contact me or Galen. So that's all I have, Galen. Sorry for taking so long. No, you're fine. Any questions on the treasury? Or any questions for the treasury? Yeah. I've been encouraging people to uh, join ARRL through the club because uh, they give a kickback to the club system. We've got any revenues like that? I don't believe we get any revenue. Or I have not received in the last two and a half years from ARL. Maybe it's something I should ask about. I didn't know there was that program. Uh, let me interrupt real quick. I do have a uh, copy of a, a list of duties for the treasurer and helpful experience. If anybody would like to take some, I only have 10 copies, would like to take one to give or to look at it to see if they might be interested in the job. So, but no, on AARL, I don't. I will check into that, though. Mark, is, is there? Yes, there is a, a program. It is typically run. Stand by. Okay. <laughs> it's a, a, yes, there's a program. It's typically run um, on a, on, we get the money and we split it out to the, to the, uh, league however the league is working very hard to turn that around and we january they've been tracking our stuff uh john um, stratton's pushed that really hard the division director so that we can get our kickback from the league uh, we're actually working on on a plan to increase the money coming back to think it's currently 10 bucks on a new member two bucks on a, on a renewal um and uh, the goal is to put that money up and i'm i'm wanting to get it before we do eight it's where we do a rl bucks where we double that, we can do double it if we buy stuff from the AWRL store. So, um, yes, that's it's a big time work on. And that. it'll be done. It'll be done by computer, right? Yeah, that, it's the goal. Yes, do we have something on our, our website that encourages people to? There's not a way to do that yet, and that's what we're working on on getting going. The the new CEO David Minster is turning the crank and making a lot of that stuff happen to uh, automate some of this process and. And uh, I have a meeting 27th, I think, with them to uh, try to uh, talk about how that's going to happen. Mark, I joined ARL back in March before I knew the club. Yeah. Got a kickback. So when I renew and. When you renew, we will, we are, the hope is that we'll come back through. If not, we can do it through a, a person meeting here where the idea is you pay us and then we pay the league, is how that works. It's, it's clunky, but we're going to fix that. Yeah, Bill. And part of the AWRL. Uh, some of the advantages uh, and reading to join AWRL. Okay. Uh, yes, I am the AWRL um, section manager, which means I'm the lead guy in the state for the league. Um, so that's uh, my uh, piece. I'm a volunteer uh, person that makes that happen. Um, we as are the are 160,000 members strong of the uh, AWRL. Uh, there's about 700,000. Um, amateurs that are existing in the uh, United States. We are trying to, uh, we're going to do a project soon where we're going to do a, a census. The idea is to go back and try to find some of the, the hams that have fallen away and see why they've fallen away uh, from the hobby uh, and bring them back in. But the league is the big thing is, is advocacy. They're the ones that stand up for us in uh, uh, headquarters or in uh, FCC where they give us these great big Whatever, whatever Kim said, this great big block of frequencies, you know, there those are worth. I think the last stuff that they they pulled from us was the 3.6 3.6 gigahertz range, and they got 80 billion dollars cash for the frequencies that that they gave up from us. So the value of our stuff is huge. The um, that's out there, 
and we get a, a part of that because the league pushes the buttons to make that stuff happen. The league also sponsors the Logbook of the World, which is a piece that that um, uh, Kim and, and uh, Jeff were talking about. They uh, sponsor field day. They sponsor all the field activities. Um, there's four really great magazines. You can pick one of them to be delivered to your house and the other four, the other three, I guess all four, you can get online um, and make those happen. So uh, lots of good stuff, lots of lots of goodies. Commercial over is what Galen say. Oh, actually, while you have the mic, give us technical committee report. Technical committee report is uh, is via Ed, who's up in uh, Wisconsin at this point. Everything is working. Life is good. Um, eight. Pardon? Eight, eight. Yeah, eight eight machine is still down. It's got a uh, power supply problem and an antenna problem. The antenna broke off the top of the building, so we're uh, working with them to get that fixed on that piece. But all seems well. Yeah, yeah, it's going back up. No, right. No, no, no. Repeater's still up there. It is. It is not ours. It's Michael Salem's and the uh, Alpha Sigma Delta Radio Club. Um, but uh, the we, the OU Club. Yeah, we before OU sued them. Um, <laughs> the the uh, the machine is still in place. There's a power supply on the controller that's problem, and the DB two twenty four the two and a three quarter inch uh, aluminum pole severed halfway through and fell over. Um, there's a new pole, there's a new antenna sitting in my shop uh, ready to go up there as soon as we get clearance to go up to the top. Very good, any other questions for technical committee? Okay, Mark or Chris. All right, last month we had our first in-person meeting in over a year. 52 members showed up in person, 12 via Zoom and 11 on YouTube. VE report, we had one new technician. Tech committee was the same as reported earlier. Everything's up and running. Uh, we had a program over the upcoming field day. And then for announcements, uh, Mark presented the club with the ARRL Special Service Club Award. That award is for clubs that exist to go above and beyond for their communities for amateur radio. And it's what defines it as a special service club. They are leaders in their amateur radio communities who provide active training classes, publicity programs, and actively pursue technical projects and operating activities. Michelle gave an update on the bout fish ground restoration in Muskogee that the YLs use for their yearly special event. Uh, Rodney announced he had Scars Club ball caps for sale, and the meeting ended at 11.30. This is the nice certificate that we received from ARRL for being a special service club. Okay, any questions about uh, minutes or the secretary's report? Okay, we do have one piece of business that we need to take care of. Um, back in the first of the year, we uh, need, had a need to change trustees. Uh, our former trustee wanted to retire a little bit from that duty. Uh, we have appointed uh, Ed Hatch as our trustee and Chad Cunningham as our alternate trustee. However, that also requires a vote of the membership. We intentionally put that off when we were uh, meeting primarily via Zoom, uh, simply because it's really hard to have a vote electronically. Uh, so at this time, uh, we, I would like to uh, entertain a motion to accept uh, Ed and Chad as our club trustees. Heard a motion and a second. Is uh, any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Anybody opposed, raise your hand. Very good. Mr. Secretary, would you please note that uh, those have been officially approved by the membership, a uh, majority of the membership that are present at the meeting. 
All right. Operating, who's done, uh, speaking of DX, who's done some DX? Tell us all about it. Uh, tell us who you are, because the guys on camera can't see you. I'm Bob W5RG, and 10 meters was opened up on Thursday, and I did work into uh, CT9 and uh, a bunch of other DX stations on CW. I'm sure there was some stuff going on on Sideman, but uh, I don't have a microphone, so I only have CW. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Where, where is C9 for those of us that... Uh, you know, I, I forgot where it was. C, a CT9 ABO. I've worked him several times. Um, it's kind That's of a rare. A it's, it's up in Russia. Away, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah. Very good. That was about it. Cool. Anybody else operating? Yep. I'll be up a second, Bill. Uh, W5JWZ, I was doing parks on the air on Monday, and I got uh, Echo Charlie 1 Delta out of Spain, 80 watts. Cool. I heard Bill say something about FT8. On the, uh, on the 7th, I did something to see if I could do it. I uh, worked um, Canada, Poland, Chile and then two United States stations on FT8. There's one contact on 10 meters, one on 12, one on 15, one on 17, and one on 20, and 30. Uh, I was hoping to get 40, but it was deader than a hammer. So I just had to settle for this. It's all about contesting, even if it's with yourself, right? Yep. Okay, oh, I see Bing. Um, KG5 uh, bought a little CW uh, monitor and it could uh, uh, transmit on CW. And he brought it over and I put a little end fed, end fed antenna on it. On five milliwatts, I worked Canada and it just blew my mind. That's pretty cool. All right, anybody else? Six meters has been on fire. Cool. Thank you, Peter. That's the current waterfall right there on FT8, six meter FT8. Anybody else in the virtual uh, streaming land uh, work anything? Okay, cool deal. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, anybody uh, have new equipment? Or equipment they want to talk about. Kalen? Somebody go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's not new equipment, but my system took a major hit uh, a week ago Thursday. Blew a Ringo Ranger in 10 and 2. Uh, so I, the repeaters are up. Uh, they're still transmitting and we're still receiving. Uh, there's no interfaces right now. Hopefully that will be cured in a while. Uh, if someone has a HRI 200 by Yesu, the, the controller, or not the, the interface, uh, that I could borrow for a little bit, make sure my repeater is still talking to one. Mine got blown in two, or not blown in two, but it's, it's uh, defective. But uh, anyway, I'll be working to get that back on. But if someone has an HRI 200 that I can call, I would appreciate it. Very good. And while you've got your mic opened up, tell us what you were eating or cooking a while ago. Uh, hamburgers and hot dogs. You're right over. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Any hot links? Uh, had, had, a had a query from in here. Nope. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. Net report. Anybody else with equipment or equipment needs? I um, I purchased a Ubiquity Rocket M5, which is a microwave point-to-point -point type 
uh, thing with an Omni antenna. I bought one personally, and then I also bought one for the city. And uh, hopefully with the assistance of Mark, uh, we spent one entire Elmer night trying to program the things, um, which we got, Mark, you know, there's no we in this, it's over there. Uh, it is up uh, and at least talking to each other. And unfortunately, I've not had the time to uh, try and see if it will uh, connect with the mesh network in the area, but that's uh, uh, one of the things out of field day was uh, trying to get the data side running. Uh, through microwave point-to-point -point mesh network. So did I see your hand up with the equipment over here? Nope, okay. Very good. Net reports, uh, Peter, Siren Net. Yeah, hey, Mark, put up the Siren page there if you would on the big screen. Can't tell if it's up there, but uh, yeah, so Siren Net at noon today. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion in the email. Uh, both Moore and Norman are, are testing audibly today. Uh, don't We never know if Newcastle or Noble are, but usually they follow Moore and Norman. So we will have a net today. I am in the barrel today. Uh, that'll be at noon. Uh, trying to think if there's anything relevant to mention about the test. Uh, if you have a siren in your neighborhood that is not already spoken for, uh, you too can be a siren observer. Uh, send an email to siren at w5nor.org and we will figure it all out with you. Um, a lot of them are covered, particularly Norman. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers in the other cities, though. That's all I'll say about that, I think. Very good. Questions on Sirenet? There is Sirenet today. Yes, there is. In 50 some minutes. Yes. So correct. we need to finish up and get out of here so we can get, get on All down. All that there. is true. All right. 10 meter net. Bill. Bill, we would like anyone that can to join us on Wednesday night, every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Central Time, uh, 28.445 Upper Side Band for the 10 meter net. And like the people have been saying, it's starting to open up a little. Uh, last Wednesday, I think we had a station in Nevada came in very strong. Uh, and then there was a four lander that came in also. So it's uh, starting to get get active. Very good, thank you. Uh, where's Dan? Oh, there's Danny. Gossip net. Gossip net immediately following the uh, Aries net on Tuesday night at about out uh, or about eight thirty, where you can come in there and just rag you. We can talk about whatever you like. Just don't time out the repeater, they say. Anyhow, come join us on Tuesday night. Does anybody hear a six meter net, Jim? I don't see Jim. Anybody want? We have six meter net on Monday nights, uh, fifty dot two hundred upper sideband. Uh, six meter can be fun depending on how things are. Um, I saw a Facebook post of my own from a year or two ago that I had uh, stuck a temporary antenna up in the backyard and so I could join on the six meter net. And as I was taking, before the net, I'd heard some stations booming in like from Georgia. And uh, then after the net, I was, I was taking the antenna down. Uh, I had it sitting about head high and one i had a little yagi set up and one end was drooping and, and like i said i was taking it down so it didn't matter and uh, off the back side i heard Mont and worked montana so it was uh, a lot of fun six meter can be fun try it aries net aries net happens tuesday evening eight o'clock local time on the ocean coast stars repeater uh, usually we do it over the repeater. Sometimes we do it on VHF Simplex. And once in a great while, we even do it on the UHF repeater just to give you a chance to check out your UHF equipment. The net control operators are doing a great job. We're averaging about 35 contacts on Tuesday night. Very good. Uh, and I'll come back to emergency communications here in just a little bit. 
Lee, are you still with us virtually? If so, you want to tell us about the I am, I am, sir. Uh, every Monday night at 8.15 p.m., we do the Oklahoma Statewide Aries DMR net on top group 3140. Again, it's at 8.15 p.m. And uh, we always try to have a training session in there with it. And I'll take this, uh, this brief second to remind everybody, <clears throat> if you do not have a... Uh, an application on your smartphone that can utilize the GPS system, please download one. It is gonna be one of your best tools that you'll have in your toolbox in order and an, an emergency to work with. So thanks a bunch. All right, thank you, Lee. Uh, Michelle's not in the room and I don't see, Michelle, are you with us? Okay, well, there's some YL nets uh, that uh, we participate in too, or, or some of our folks do. The whole point of all of these nets is get on the air. That's what it's about. And there's no excuse. We've got nets that can work technician. We've got all sorts of voice nets that can work technician, general, uh, all the way up. So uh, uh, avail yourself of that, please. All right, just a few more, couple of things real quick. Uh, Memorial Marathon will be in October. I believe it's the second and third, or third and fourth, maybe. Is it Friday, Saturday, or Saturday, Sunday, Mark? Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday. Um, communications is handled, minute, much of the communications is handled via amateur radio. It takes over 100 amateur radio operators to participate, or to uh, affect that. Um, your assistance is always needed. Uh, go to our, that's on our club site. You got up, right? Yep, you can volunteer there. Uh, please sign up. Uh, you don't have to have much in equipment uh, handheld, preferably with a uh, either a power supply or a backup battery. Uh, some of the things will, you'll do quite a bit of operating um, and you'll get assigned stuff and, and so on. So please sign up if you're available to work the marathon. Um, I said I would come back to emergency communications and I will do that. Uh, how many in here have taken the OXCOM course? I know there's a couple. Bill has, Bill Baker, were you in the OXCOM? Okay, Bill Lockett was, Phil was. Uh, OXCOM is the amateur radio component of public safety uh, communication, uh, the communications unit. Um, it is different from the AWRL MCOM stuff, but uh, the OXCOM course, there will be one hosted in the Oklahoma City area mid-October. I don't the dates I don't think have been exactly set. I think it's the week of October 18th. Um, it's a two or three day course. It will be during the day, during the week, uh, which I know will preclude some folks, but um, uh, that's the instructors are coming, they're federal instructors, they're coming in from wherever they're coming in from, uh, and we'll put that course on. We are working in the uh, Oklahoma Public Safety Communications Unit uh, uh, to develop our own instructors, and then we can instruct whenever we want. Um, dates aren't set yet, I don't believe. Uh, it's, it'll be that week, we just don't know when yet, or I haven't been told yet. Uh, uh, simply because we're, we're trying to figure out the instructor schedules. So I will get information out on that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am the public safety uh, communications unit uh, for the state. I am the OXCOM coordinator for that. Uh, want to, it kind of, kind of goes with nets and kind of doesn't. I'd like to remind you that uh, we actually do have meetings every week. It's called Elmer Nights. Uh, it's right here. Mark, you're generally here about 6.30. Is that right? 6.30 to 9. 6.30 to 9. So if you've got something you want to work on, something you need help with, uh, want to come hang out with fellow hands, Tuesday nights, 6.30 to 9, right here. There's still a Zoom component, I think. Uh, so some of those guys uh, are still still active too. Mark, our next program is what? Ed Fong, J-Poles. Ed Fong, J-Poles, cool. 
Uh, by the way, Wayne, our vice president and program coordinator had a uh, different commitment this morning, so that's why he's not here. Um, but we will uh, we'll have a program at next meeting on J-Polls. Is there anything else for the good of the club? PE report. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Peter. Can you throw that up on the screen, Mark? It should be up to date. Yeah, we like to recognize the new hams, one of whom is in uh, is in uh, attendance today. David, KI5QMF, past technician. Give him another round of applause, if you will. Woo! Yeah. Uh, welcome to the hobby. Uh, we also, uh, that was on field day. Then we had our regularly scheduled tests at the beginning of the month, first Thursday, as we always do. Uh, my house had running water in it. So uh, Mark stepped up and took over the, Mark is one of the deputy team leaders along with, uh, with Wayne and, uh, or along with Michelle rather, of the team. Uh, stepped up, took over and uh, Kathy, KI5QPA is a new technician and Brenda, KI5OLH, who I think she got licensed in March, I want to say, uh, upgraded to general. So, yay. Good job, all of those people. Uh, August 3rd is, uh, excuse me, August 5th is the next session, and then September 2nd. Uh, latest word on the uh, FCC's application fee is, yeah, soon, sometime, we're pretty sure. Yeah, I know, we said it was going to start in April, whatever. So if you need to renew and you're within 90 days of expiration, please get it done, get it done. Save yourself a couple bucks. Uh, that's all I got. Very good. Thank you, Peter. Anything else for the good of the club? Bing. Uh, new business. Uh, new business. It's been recommended that we get uh, three common mode chokes and I'd like to move that the club do so. Okay, do we want to take a motion on the, up to you guys, I don't care. Do we want to take a motion on that or do we want to have our technical committee figure out what they want first? How about a motion to direct the technical committee to explore that and get back to us? Second. Actually, it doesn't take a vote to do that. The president says go do it. Ah, very good. Streamlined. Okay, so Bing, we'll come back. We'll bring that back. Um, Chris, be sure and make a note on that so I'll remember to bring it up next month. All right. I move the table motion until we get yeah, okay. I'm not going to worry about motions and stuff right now. We're just going to have the check committee go do it. Uh, figure out what they need, and then we'll, if it's need, we'll, we'll bring it back to the club for, for vote. All right. Anything else for the good of the club? I have a question about recently I read, uh, I think it was an ARRL or publication about uh, the Cycle 25 recently had a solar storm that just wiped out all bands for about an hour. Anybody experienced that? Missed it. It was an X-Class flare. It was the first X-Class since 2017. Yeah, nobody, nobody here is involved in that, huh? Somebody, somebody mentioned it at breakfast, I think. Oh, okay. They said they were talking on 40 and it just disappeared. Just yeah. Oh, maybe you were going to say that uh, everybody was at breakfast and therefore they missed it. <laughs> there you go. Okay, anything else? We are having our breakfast meetings if anybody wants to attend in person. Breakfast meetings are back in person at the McDonald's on Lindsay Street, right? Right. Whenever you show up, I think. 8.30 to 11.00. <laughs> okay, anything else? Anything else? Yeah. Everybody, oh, go ahead, whoever's on. It's, it's Lee, and I'd like to remind everybody, if you have not uh, read anything on EMP or you haven't read it recently, uh, this would be a really good time for you to start renewing your information on uh, electromagnetic pulses. Okay, very good. And by the way, I did get your text, so we'll get back with you on that. All right, anything else? Everybody go forth and get on the air and pay your dues to Hank. <laughs>